Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Fantastic book of Proverbs. Proverbs gives you a set of comparisons uh, to help you make your mind up as to how you want to live your life. And they are certainly true sayings. Basically, what happens to you if you do things right? And the comparison is what happens to you if you do things wrong? And wisdom does a great deal of talking and teaching in this book of Proverbs. Wisdom is something you want to listen to because it always comes from God. Chapter 6, verse 1, I'm talking about divine wisdom. And that verse 1 reads, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy, thy hand with a stranger, that's a zur. Now, we, we learned in the last lecture what a zur is. That's an apostate. That's one that claims to be of your group, but has a different belief. And uh, stricken your hand, if, if you shook hands on something and made an agreement and you stood good for him, surety means you, you, you signed for him. You took responsibility. Let me tell you something. If you do that with a zur, uh, an apostate, you're, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Verse 2, Thou art snared, you're trapped, with the words of thy mouth. Your own mouth did it to you. That's why you want to be careful, friend. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. In other words, um, you trapped by, you're trapped by your agreement with a zur, with an apostate. So why, uh, wisdom wants you to know you got to watch false religions. An, an apostate is one that still would even claim to be a Christian. But they do not understand the chronological order of events. They usually do not know the difference between the false Christ and the true Christ. That is to say, the order of the consummation. And therefore, they're they're not familiar with the fact that there are two tribulations and the false uh, Christ and his tribulation comes before the tribulation of God. And the tribulation of God, we don't have to worry about anyway. Why? Because God loves us. So when you make agreements with people, you better fare thee well know who you're making an agreement with if you're standing surety for them. That means if if your good name is put on the line for an apostate, you're trapped. What do you do about it? Verse 3, do this now. This means quickly. Don't waste time quickly, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, Go humble thyself. That means you swallow a little bit of your pride and you get down there where the rubber meets the road and make sure thy friend. In other words, um, uh, you um, ask the friend to release you from the agreement. Swallow a little pride and, and, and um, you, you back out like an old Oklahoma crawdad. Of, of that agreement. Now, I don't know how many of you know what that is, but that's scooting backwards in a big way, fast, okay? And that's what do this now means, is quick, 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 okay? Verse 4, Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids. In other words, you take care of it, and, and uh, you uh, deliver thyself means you rescue yourself. You get out of that. Don't, don't let your mouth put you in that position. When, when you're making surety for someone or making agreement with someone, it's very important that when you shake on something, that's a contract, especially in God's eyes. Uh, if I shake hands with you on an agreement, 
you can go to any lawyer you want to, draw up all the papers you want to, it won't make it any surer than my handshake because I will stick to that word. You should too. Therefore, it should become all the more important as to who you shake with, all right? Who you make an agreement with. Certainly not an apostate. That's trouble going somewhere to happen. And let me t assure you, you might say, well, isn't that in just part of the cases? Uh-uh. If they're an apostate, that's all the cases. And the biggest trouble hasn't even happened yet with them. Let's go with the next verse, verse 5. Deliver thyself, you free yourself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. That, that's to say, um, they, get yourself out of the snare as a bird would from the trap, okay? Uh, fight to get out of the trap. And, and remember, the, the important lesson is, is don't go there again. Your name is very valuable when you're a child of God. As, as we learned in the last lecture in verse 21, the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and he pondereth all his goings. God knows what you do. God knows when you shake on something. You're supposed to be taking care of God's business, not some apostate. He tells you don't even darken their door, okay? Um, verse 8 of the last chapter, Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. So, um, an apostate is trouble, okay? False religions. And, and they can even, most apostates will call themselves Christians. It's just that they don't follow this book. They don't follow this word. And there you have it. Uh, don't, don't ensnare yourself in the ways of the world. All right. Now, let's change the subject a little bit. Verse 6 to continue. Go to the ant. I want you to take this analogy. Look at the little old ant for a moment. Thou sluggard. It's written to sluggard means um, um, indolent or lazy. Just a plain old lazy person. Okay. Go to the ant, thou lazy person, and consider her ways and be wise. You, you learn some sense. Learn how to get some common sense about you. God just doesn't like lazy people. Okay. He makes that very clear in this book of Proverbs in more, more places than one. Verse 7, which having no guide, that means a leader, overseer, uh, that means a foreman, or a ruler, uh, that means um, um, doesn't have um, a big boss over them. It, they just understand, they just do what is natural. They, they don't... Uh, you know, you can take a team and pay them well enough and have good people in executive positions. You can get a lot done. But it's got to be all laid out for them. But not the ant. They, through nature, know exactly what to do. And they work their little old selves, getting set. What for? Eight, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. In other words, she's out there working every day to stand by for winter to get it set. Verse 9, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard, you lazy person? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Well, I'll just turn the alarm off and let it ring a while again in a little bit, and I'll look for a job tomorrow. I, I really, I've got to get out there and get with it. My intentions are good. Yeah, but you're lazy. Doesn't matter what your intentions are if you're lazy. Verse 10, yet a little sleep, just a little more. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, meaning that, that's an idiom that means your hands don't have anything to do because you're lazy. So you just fold them up and say, I'll just, I'll do it tomorrow. Get around to it tomorrow. That's your typical lazy person, okay? Or as God would call them, a sluggard. And um, so it is. Next verse, let's go with it. Verse 11. 
So shall thy poverty, that's to say your need, come as one that travaileth, like a highwayman, a robber, and thy want as an armed man. In other words, uh, it's always going to lead you into trouble because pretty soon your, your poverty, the word poverty in this uh, book is translated uh, uh, many different words, but this particular one in the Hebrew means when the very needs of livelihood come along, it's going to slip up on this one and they're going to be really caught in trials for just the basic needs of life. And then they have to act like a highwayman that is armed. That means to take something from somebody else. That's where the trouble comes in. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's from their own family. That's, that's bad, okay? Verse 12, change the subject. Get off of the, the, the lazy person for a minute. Verse 12, a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. That's to say a perverse mouth, always coming up with something, maybe even claim it's of God, but it's his own selfish, um, foolish thoughts. Okay? And um, a naughty person could be a person of Bilal, okay, or worships Baal. Certainly not Christ, because Christ doesn't act perverse. And anytime somebody goes perverse, they're going to the devil, okay? And you might say, well, how do I know for sure? Well, I'm going to tell you something. It could even be man and wife or vice versa. Well, aren't we supposed to respect anyone? You don't respect a fool. If you respect a fool and follow a fool, I don't care if it is your husband or your wife, you're a bigger fool than they are. And don't, don't buy into that stuff. You know right from wrong, and the comparisons of this book of Proverbs make that very clear. So what he's saying is all they can do is cause trouble. But they're an apostate. They may even claim to be a Christian. I want, I want to work for God in a perverse way. That doesn't fly, friend. You can't get sweet and bitter water out of the same well. That won't work nor can you out of the same mind. Verse 13, He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. In other words, kind of given in the third part, like when he's putting you on with his big line of nothingness. It'll be okay. He's winking at the third party. And he teaches not with the word of God, not with the Holy Spirit, but with his own signs and wonders that he dreams up. Be very careful following a person like that. That's worse than shaking hands with a zur. This is real trouble. This will get you in big trouble. 14, frowardness. Th this word's a little different than, than perverse. Frowardness, as it is used here in the Hebrew, is deceitfulness. That's what you got to look out for. Deceitfulness is in his heart, in his mind. That's all he can think about. He deviseth mischief. Continually he soweth discord. It's just trouble, trouble, trouble. Don't listen to him once. Don't listen to him twice. And certainly if you listen a third time, you're a bigger fool than he is. So, you know, common sense is a great teacher. And quite frankly, it's kind of like the little old aunt I emphasized. It's just natural. She just goes by nature. That's a good rule of the thumb. Anytime somebody tries to go against that that is natural, it's perverse. Okay. You're, you're not going to have God happy with you if you go against the natural order of things. We have some strange people in this world today and they're servants of Baal, and they're apostates. And the eyes, feet, and the fingers can almost hypnotize you into thinking something is right. You remember what it said about the Zur? Her mouth is like a honeycomb. Well, so is the, the, the male Zur. His mouth is like a honeycomb. It'll be okay. Well, not if it goes against God's word. 
It's a one-way trip to hell. You sure don't need that. Verse 15, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Oh, is he going to get it? Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. There's no rescue for someone like that. He's certainly not going to repent. If he did, then we could maybe talk about it a little further. But unfortunately, he'll carry it on until there is no time for rescue. Verse 16, listen carefully, learn from the Word of God. These six things doth the Lord hate. You might make a mental note of these and always remember them. Many people will ask you this. They'll say, well, I didn't know God could hate. Well, he, he, he hates certain things. He hated Esau even as it's written in the great book of Malachi. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. You might remember the seventh because not only does he hate it, he considers it to be an abomination. So you want to learn that one real good. 17, a proud look. That's one. Pride is what brought Satan down, pride of this nature, okay? Wanting people to worship that person. Ego trip deluxe. A lying tongue, that's two. God hates a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood, that's three, okay? 18, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, that's four dreams up stuff and said, God told me this and God did not speak to them. Unnatural things, things that go against the very word of God. God hates it. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. That's five. People that jump at mischief all the time. God doesn't appreciate that. He expects you to use common sense and wisdom and not get into mischiefs that, that hurt people. You know, and many people will take this and they'll just, they think that you can't have any fun, period, in teasing people or something. It's not talking about teasing people. This is talking about doing things that are destructive to people, destroying their property or their reputation. That you do not do. That's not fun. A false witness that speaketh lies. That's six. Oh boy, does he hate a false witness. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Now that's number seven. That's the one he considers to be an abomination. What was that again? One that soweth discord against brethren. God finds that to be an abomination. You know, God wants his family to be happy, to, to mesh, to get along in the word with God's blessings. And you get one of these troublemakers that always plants these little seeds of, uh, of doubt. And, and you can kind of put, you can put the, the um, uh, visage of all these six things together to get the seventh. It's somebody that would sow discord might say, did you... You know, someone says something to you in confidence and you go to the person, you know what that person said about you? You know what that person really thinks about you? And then goes to the other person when this one says, well, I'll do this and I'll do that. Goes to the other person and says, you know what he said about you? I mean, you know, this is why that don't put up with gossip. Nip it in the bud. If somebody comes up to you and says something bad about a person, say, where did you hear that? Let's go find out who started that stuff. I mean, nip it in the bud. Don't put up with it. Why? Well, that is one of the things that can really cause trouble. Little bitty things that don't amount to a hill of beans can become a mountain. If you have that person that sows discord in the midst of you, you don't need that. And God not only hates them, he finds it to be an abomination. So you, you want to remember Proverbs 16 through 19. That's 
the sixth and the seventh things that God hates. And he won't, quite frankly, he will not tolerate it. If you expect his blessings and you participate in any of those seven, forget it. Okay. You can just put it away from you. He's not going to answer you. There is not one of those seven that your life is not a lot better off if you put them far from you. Okay. Uh, and, and again, that's a, a person can really enjoy life without participating in any of those things. Life is complete without them. It's incomplete with them. Verse 20 to continue. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. The mother is Mother Israel, and the Father, of course, is Almighty God. You keep that that God expected His children to do. Okay, 21, bind them continually upon thine heart. You keep them in your mind, okay, and tie them about thy neck. Like a garland, you wear them. Okay, This, this means in your mind, of course. You don't literally uh, put them around your neck. But they, the, the neck always is the weak spot of a man. A person who is familiar with combat, I mean, they can break a neck, bam, just that quick. Or the neck always has the juggler, and that can put you out that, I mean, it can kill you that quick. If a person knows what they're doing, see. So you want to keep that wisdom around you, and it protects the soft spots of your life and guards it from what's in your mind, the seal of God, the real truth. You, you bind them. That means don't just read it and forget it. Hang on to it. Salt it away. Meditate on it, whereby it means something to you. Quite frankly, some might say, well, that sounds difficult. No, it's just it's just simply what you would want people to do to you and you to do to them, to get along. That's all it is. It's wisdom. It's common sense. Verse 22, then, to continue. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. It'll do it. Wisdom will keep you right on the right path. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. It'll protect you. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. It, it, it'll, you, wisdom will give you the ability to meditate and find the right path and the best way to accomplish things. Always. And don't, don't just uh, push off into the dark and not knowing for sure what you're doing. Always have a plan. That's wisdom. Always know what you're doing. I even like to take it one step further than that. Uh, being a pilot, naturally, I always have an alternate course. And I do the same thing with my planning for the day. I always wake up enough to get good and awake and plan my day and know if I'm going to do a certain thing. If it won't work one certain way, I'm, I'm going to have an alternate way to try it. It's going to work. Don't be a quitter. God doesn't particularly care for quitters either. But wisdom will do that for you if you will absorb the wisdom, divine wisdom from Almighty God. Okay. Verse 23, For the commandment is a lamp. It'll light your path. Okay, And the law is light. It'll show you how. Okay, And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. More than what you might translate that way of life, it's the way to eternal life. It's with you forever and ever and ever. It's the way you find our Father. And His commandment is that lamp. And we, this is why we can say that we are children of light. Okay? Because it's knowledge. It's wisdom. It's understanding. And that common sense goes a long way. For example, what have we learned in this chapter? Don't make an agreement with an apostate. Well, what will happen if I do? You're in deep trouble. Okay. He'll take you right down with him because you've made an agreement with somebody that is not even of your beliefs. 
Why would you do that? You set your own trap and your own mouth trapped you. That's wisdom. Learn it. Put that away and see that you'd never fall into that trap or that web. Verse 24, to keep thee from the evil woman. Who is that evil woman? That's Zer again. That's old Babylon, Sister Babylon. From the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, Nacre, as strange as utilized here, meaning someone of even a different religion. Don't, don't, don't let it, don't be misled, okay? 25, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids, batten those old eyes, old sister Babylon will, saying, come unto me. We're going to ride the beast of the end days, right over the great lake of water. You know, come on in, the water's fine. I'm not a widow, I'm a queen. Well, don't, don't get in the saddle with her, friend. You'd be sadly mistaken, as, and, and I'm quoting from Revelation chapter 17, okay? She will tell you, she will court you, she will con you, and it seems like such a wonderful religion. There's just one trouble. The head of it's the false Christ. You're supposed to be a virgin when the true Christ returns. What happened in a case like that? Don't shake hands with the Zer. 26, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That's to say soul, go for the soul. And the destruction of a soul is far worse than the destruction of a body. This needs a little bit of work and there's much contradiction as to what it truly means. What do I think it means? I think it means that those that participate with the great harlot in the end times, that's to say those deception, the harlots are so plentiful that all it takes to buy one of them is a piece of bread. Now, the other side of that coin, spiritually speaking, is we have bread. It's called the bread of life. It's the body of Christ. Don't you dare sell it or adulterate it with the Zer, with false teachings, with, with people that would uh, follow anything that comes along, but never checking out the Word of God to see where it came from. You stay with the cup and the bread that we partake of. For we know from experience, reading Daniel 9, 27, that in the middle of the week, the, the cup and the bread will depart from uh, those uh, that uh, are ignorant of God's Word. So be careful about a piece of bread. Know what your bread is. Know which way your bread's buttered. Okay. With the body of Christ. And don't ever, ever let someone rob you of that. That is to do things unnatural. You know, you know God is so good to us you know, he takes the lazy person and he teaches in such a simple way. He said, hey, if you're not smart enough to get it any other way, could just go out here and settle down by an ant hill and watch them. You'll learn something. I created them. They're going to make hay while the sun shines. And you could do the same thing. Just watch the little ant. You could learn from so many ways, and God makes it so simple. He even tells you, hey, there's seven things I really hate. If you want my blessings, don't participate in them. What kind of person would it be if you studied, if you've read what it is God hates, and you've absorbed it, that you would do one of those things? That wouldn't be too bright, would it? I'm just, I'm drawing attention to the marvelous way that God teaches, okay? He makes it so easy for us. Verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? You just picture some old boy with overalls on and he takes a scoop of coal, hot coals and puts them in there. Not only is his britches going to get burned, he is too. In other words, if you mess around with Zer, 
if you shake hands with them, if you agree with them, boy, are you going to get burned. 28. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Not unless he's a magician. 28. In other words, think about this in the natural sense. Don't go against nature. Well, what do you mean? Well, a, a wise person doesn't go walking on hot coals. And I dispel all the tricks and things that go along with it, okay? Verse 29. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Um, stay away from, from um, that apostate, okay? Stay away from her, all right? And men, verse 30, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. You can overlook that, okay? But don't, whatever you do, Christ's wife is a sacred thing. Okay. And um, if you're going to wear the wedding garment, you're, you're not going to allow the false one to come in unto you. Okay, Verse 31, But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house, in other words, what it's saying is once he, if he's caught, he's a good man. He doesn't, you know, usually to restore, it's either twofold or at most four, fourfold. Okay. That's repaying for theft. But this sevenfold means everything he's got. That proves he's a good guy. Okay. 32, but, in, but whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Verse 33, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. The disgrace from it. I, I, I want you to know, for you deeper scholars, what we're talking about here is, um, is um, um, well, I, I, I think I choose not to go there the true meaning of adultery, okay? If you don't know, then fine, but uh, check it out, okay? In, in the Word of God. Beware Nacor, that's what I'm saying. One more verse, 33, a wound and dishonor shall he get, well, we, and uh, his reproach shall not be wiped away. We had that. I'm gonna go ahead and finish this chapter, 34. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Now that lets us, what is the day of vengeance? That's when the true husband returns, Jesus Christ, and finds his bride with a small suckling child, as is written in Mark chapter 13 and Matthew 24. He will, 35 to complete, he will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. In other words, there's no way you're going to buy your set way out of it. Okay. He will not be content. You, if you do not have the wedding garment on, hey, just forget it. You're not taking part in the wedding, maybe at the end of the millennium, but not then. So there you have it. Don't shake hands with a zur. That is to say, don't make an agreement. That's, that's to guarantee for him. Um, let me ask you a question. If someone follows Satan instead of God, uh, you want to stand good for them? Do you know where they're going? I mean, you've read God's Word. You know where they're going. And, and you would be silly enough to stand good for them? Be careful, my friend. <clears throat> you know, uh, then you will have the bleeding heart Christian that will come along and say, well, I don't understand that. Well, if you're going to have anything to do with them, convert them back to the truth and then let them be your brother or sister. But as long as they are azure, use wisdom, uh, that's an apostate, and stay clear. Okay, That's God's Word. That is truth. That is wisdom. All right. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Uh, please never ask a question about a different religion, reverend, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Our Father's plenty good at that. We don't have to. All you do is teach His Word, never apologize for it, let the chips fall where they may. Now, if you've got a prayer request, those of you that listen around the world, um, then our Father, um, by short wave, our Father loves you. You don't need the telephone number. You don't need an address if you have a prayer request. Talk to Him. He knows what you're thinking. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and uh, Pastor Murray, Cheryl from Georgia. Are children at their age of death uh, the same age in heaven? My 11-year-old was curious. Uh, no, no we're, we're all the same age in spiritual bodies. Okay. There's, uh, and, and there is no such thing. These flesh bodies are perishable. They age, they wrinkle, they get sick. But to the spiritual body, there's no such thing as age, okay? And uh, whichever side of the gulf you're on, you're still in that spiritual body. But you might still have a mortal soul, even though you're in a spiritual body. And a mortal soul means you're liable to die, spiritually speaking, uh, at the great white throne judgment. So um, everybody's about, it's the same age. Everybody was basically... Uh, with God in the first earth age, and so it is. Jack from New York. When Jesus returns at the seventh trump, who's coming with him and who's not? Where will those uh, who don't return be? Well, well, they'll be with the Father in heaven. Revelation 15 makes this very clear, where heaven is sealed through the millennium. The full Godhead, de jure, does not return to this earth until the day of the great white throne judgment. Then the full Godhead returns. But as it is written, Christ and his teachers, um, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, will kind of tell you who comes with him. The priest, that's to say those that teach. That is to say those that have the seal of God in their forehead those, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, God chose even before the foundations of this age, the second. They were chosen in the first earth age. They're going to be with Him. He can trust them. They teach. And um, what will be taught in the millennium if everybody already knows the truth? And they will in a spiritual body. Discipline. Okay. Discipline. And the others stay in heaven, as it is written in Revelation 15. John from Florida. I, I want to say one more word. Some are going to say, well, how do you know it's God's elect? Because those that are with him are singing the song of Moses. And if you know the song of Moses and know when and why you'll be singing it, you are one of God's elect. John from Florida. Where is it written where God created all souls at the same time? Well, we're, we're going to be to one of the places in just a few days. We'll be recovering that in the 8th proverb. But you can also read of it in the 38th chapter of Job. All the, 
there's no gender in this. It's all the sons of God were as the stars of heaven. When, and and he, even the stars he knows by name. He certainly knows his people. Okay. God created all things for his pleasure. The last verse of Revelation chapter 4. Ray from Canada. Will Israel have to sign a peace agreement with certain nations before the deadly wound? Well, uh, all the whole world, because that's why it's called a world government, one world government system. They all have to sign that. However, there will be a great disagreement uh, when this uh, one world system almost makes it together, almost get it done, and then it receives a deadly wound, not an individual. It is not an individual that will receive a deadly wound. It is the system that receives the deadly wound. And at that moment, the sixth trump sounds, the dragon, the false Christ, Satan appears and makes, he kisses it, puts a Band-Aid on it, and it's all better, okay? And the world moves into world peace thinking Christ has returned, only he's a fake, okay? Terry from Oklahoma, please explain Luke chapter 10, verse 19. I, I probably quote that chapter and verse more than any other chapter in the Bible. Well, it's because if you read verse 18, I beheld Satan as a star fall from heaven, like as lightning fall from heaven, okay? Because he's coming. And then Christ continues on in 19, but I give you power over all of your enemies, over the scorpions of Revelation chapter 9, the serpent himself, any enemy you might have in Christ's name, you have power over them. But then he continues on in the next thought, which is so beautiful. Don't think this is the greatest thing in the world, that you have power over all your enemies, but that you're called that you have the truth. That's what's, what you want to be thankful for. Uh, Stan from California. My wife and I have been married for 42 years and I love her dearly. Well, fantastic. Uh, I, I know we won't be married in heaven, but do you think we will be able to hang out together forever? Thank God for your wonderful teaching of His Word. Now I'm going to tell you something. You two do have a great love affair. If you've been together 42 years, and you still want to be hung, hanging out together for the eternity, you, you got it made, okay? I'm proud of both of you. You will know each other, and you'll be doing just fine, okay? You will, you'll be uh, I'm, uh, acquainted with each other and probably have near the same duties. Donna from Indiana. What books do you study and have studied to gain such knowledge and understanding? Please keep it up and... And I pray that uh, you will keep coming in out my area. I am sending us. Well, that, that's great. We appreciate that. But uh, I, there's there's one thing maybe a little different for me than other than history itself. There's only one book I study, and this is it right here. Okay, from this comes all wisdom. Okay, and if most pastors would do all of their studying here in some such gobbledygook writings of man, there'd be a lot better teachers in the world. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying um, it's a full-time job to absorb. Naturally, I, you know, I go to the manuscripts, which is the same book, only in a different language, and, and study from there. And, and um, it's a full lifetime job because God's Word is pregnant and it grows and grows and grows and that's one of the reasons I love teaching it, okay? Uh, but but uh, that's my book and that's the book that uh, my knowledge comes from and I thank our Father for the gift of uh, studying it and teaching it. Inez from Mississippi. I have always been taught rapture all my life, and I'm 85 years old. I have just learned that there is no rapture. Anybody with one eye and half sense can see that in the Bible. Well, God bless you. you you're coming along, I'll tell you for sure. Question, 
is the peace they are trying to get going to be the one world order? That's what they're going for and ultimately will almost come to being, but it, as I stated earlier, it'll get a deadly wound. How long will the one world peace be in effect before Antichrist comes? Well, it, um, it won't ever get into effect. It receives a deadly wound, almost, but not quite. As I stated, Revelation 13, 4. Will the two prophets be here when Antichrist is here? I'm going to say that you mean the two witnesses, and yes, they will be here a few days before he appears. Is this right? Antichrist will be here five months, and then Jesus comes to earth. You got it. You're getting there. Revelation chapter 9 documenting that. Anita from California. I'm sorry, Colorado. So bottom line, what is, is what can I show and share my children and husband that would open their eyes to the truth that the Bible is our guide and loving guidance from Almighty Father besides the Bible? Well, I, you know, I, I think the word is about it, but uh, you know what, Anita? I can tell from your letter here that you're, you're planting those seeds with the family and um, not everybody, as you've heard me say, have eyes to see or ears to hear. And all you can do, if God has not chosen them, then all you can do is set the example before them and you're doing a fantastic job. I, I know the Father must be very proud of you for working with your family as you do. You be patient as only a mother can be with that kind of patience and uh, set that uh, example and, and continue sharing what God gives you uh, to those especially that will listen and be thankful that, a, that one or two of them do listen and pray for the others, setting that example. Um, I know in my heart and mind that the religions other than Christianity are man-made. Where can I find study and study the all year all these false religions? I, um, I, I, I would stick with studying God's Word. I wouldn't study the false religions necessarily or what you're calling false religions. And... and um, um, there, there are ways to understand. A uh, good world book encyclopedia is as good as you're going to get, okay? Uh, William from Michigan. Um, my question is this. Do cold-blooded murderers who kill and mutilate the person's body face hell for what they did automatically? This comes to, this crimes I hear about make me sick. Well, you know, you're asking me to make a judgment on somebody and I can't do that, okay? There is one reason, uh, William, that God demands capital punishment for the person you're talking about, that cold blood, meaning premeditates. And you can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, chapter 19. Okay, and um, uh, where if a person lies in wait, God demands that they suffer capital punishment and be sent to him, and he's the judge. Okay, um, I, I personally, and as it's written in the first epistle of John, now not St. John, the first epistle of John, in chapter 3, verse 15, a premeditated murder, fognants in the Greek, okay, I'm, 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 I feel more comfortable saying that, um, cannot have salvation in the flesh. Why? Because he's got to, they, they are to be executed. And th this is cold blood, it's not a crime of passion or something of that nature. But you got to leave that in God's hands as to whether they can be forgiven or not, okay. God knows their heart and mind. And um, that's his business. They do not automatically go to hell. Their main trial will be held in front of God, and he makes that decision. Jason from, I think that's Michigan, I'm going to say, will God allow us to go back in time and change things? 
in our lives, I feel like I'm not going to be able to move forward unless I went backward. I, I mean, thanks, Jason, that you're having a hard time forgiving yourself. You know something? You're not perfect. Uh, we, all, we all slip up. Do you know that old Paul himself kind of had this attitude? Paul had a hard time uh, forgiving himself for the fact that he persecuted the church so severely before his conversion. Uh, he, he really did. He wrestled with that. But God forgave him. That's the beauty of Christianity, Jason, is that God forgives. You don't have to go back. He, do you know why you don't have to go back? Because when you repent and mean it, it's erased. It wouldn't do you any good to go back because it's gone. Okay. And do you know what Father says? I don't want to hear about it again. That's what he says. So you'd be kind of silly floating around in the back when everything's erased and gone and you got nothing to look at. So thank God for Christianity and the greatest gift is forgiveness. John from Washington, one of the greatest gifts is forgiveness. John from Washington, I understand wars on earth. I was in one, but how is a war fought in heaven? Well, John, read, you know, there is one particular one mentioned in Daniel chapter 10. And two, two of the champions uh, got into it, okay? And Michael and Satan war all the time, okay? And, and Michael always wins. It isn't only Michael, but it's Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. That's what Daniel 10 is about. But the greatest war of all in heaven takes place when God finally gets tired of, of, um, of everything going as it is and the fact that all the children have been born of woman. Every soul that he created will be born of woman. Then shall come the end. And then shall that war that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, Michael and his angels are going to war against Satan and his angels and boot them out of heaven. They're going to be goners, okay? But they're coming right down here to earth, and then our war starts, standing against the false Messiah, okay? And hey, guess what? We can cut it. That Luke 10, 19 that we quoted earlier, that gives us the authority and the license in Christ's name. Okay, I've got, who do I have here? I've got Larry from Georgia. Please explain Romans 8, 26, and 27. I've been studying with you only for a short time, but I'm enjoying very much uh, learning our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. Well, Romans um, 8, uh, 26, and 27, what, some of my favorite, one of my favorite chapters in God's Word. They all are, but that one particularly. What it's talking about is to the saints, which simply means the set-aside ones. That's, that's the ones God foreordained. As it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you from the first earth age at Satan's rebellion. You stood against him then, and he says in verse 26, you don't really know what to pray for. And you as an individual probably don't. And he said, that's why I will intercede in your life. That's speaking to one of God's elect. He won't intercede in somebody else's life unless they ask him. But in the election, he will intercede in their life to make come to pass things according to God's plan, not man's. Okay. So it's talking about predestination, preordination. That's exactly what it means, and um, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. Uh, Ernie from Canada, th that's also, I've got to say, add one other thing. That's also the chapter where the very earth itself groans for the return of Christ and this earth returning back to its proper orbit. Ernie from Canada, I got your tapes called The Most Asked Questions, and I know when we die we go back to the back to dust or earth and our flesh bodies and our soul goes back to God as you said absent from the body is present with the Lord in paradise both believers and non-believers 
do the believers and non-believers see each other and communicate? Well, well, they can see each other because we know the rich man could see Lazarus the cross in the bosom of Abraham on the good side, such as loved ones on different gulfs. And you can, during the millennium, be able to cross over and help a loved one if you're on the right side. You've got to be on the side of God and you've got to be one of God's elect. And as it is written in Ezekiel 44, verse 20 through 25, uh, you can go help a close relative, okay, if they're in trouble, if they're not coming along as they should, and um, you can help them get their act together. Uh, Sydney from Virginia. When Jesus died and taught the three days which while his body was in the grave, did he go all the way back to the people of the six-day creation? Of course he did. God does not play favorites. And... He went all the way back to that time, and the documentation is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, and his success you will read in the first few verses of chapter 4 of um, 1 Peter, and so it is. Uh, um, and we got Bob from Nevada. As I understand in Genesis 126 states that the man Adam creation, all the races were made in our image, Genesis 127, and God said, create eth ha'adam. Why? Because God included himself. That means he was talking about Jesus Christ, and he was eth ha'adam, not the six-day creation. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. He truly does. And um, it makes his day, and when you make his day, he's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. One thing most important, though, it's this. Hey, you listen to me. Stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.